Okay, hello everyone. I hope you can all hear me. Uh, welcome to our webinar today on access to environmental information um, and specifically on how to tackle contentious exceptions. Um, this um, webinar is part of a project financed by LIFE, the Access to Justice for Korea Europe project. Um, both Anne and I, who will be presenting today, are working for Client Earth. Um, we have the project together with Justice and Environment. Um, for those of you who have not taken part in one of our webinars yet, you can ask questions on the left side, but we just ask you to put them in writing and then we just address them at the end of the webinar. Um, there won't be a possibility to speak just because we have a lot of attendees. And um, yes, so just feel free to press on the button there on the right. I think it says Q&A and then you can type away. So let's get started. So as I mentioned, um, we had already one uh, previous webinar on access to environmental information. That one covered more the basis. There's a recording available on our website that you can have a look at. Um, but I will nonetheless now go through some of the basics. So to say as a quick recap, um, first of all, uh, as a basic idea, um, everyone can request access to environment information from both the EU bodies as well as public authorities in all the EU member states. And the basic rule is that all information should be disclosed unless it is covered by a specific exception. And this is what we'll be focusing on today, the exceptions. But first of all, what is environmental information? Uh, I won't go through this definition right now, but just to recall, it's a very wide definition. It's not only information on the environment, on environment factors itself, but also on factors that affect the environment, such as energy, noise, emissions, and also on measures that are adopted, such as plans, programs, um, environmental agreements and activities uh, like permits, for instance, all of this falls under the right definition of environmental information. And, and as another part of the recap, um, the exceptions from disclosure are contained for the EU institutions in Article 4 of Regulation 1049, 2001, and Article 6. Uh, one regulation of 1367, regulation 1367, 2006, the IS regulation. And this is a closed list of exceptions from disclosure. And for the EU member states, uh, they are contained in Article 4 of Directive 2003-4, and they're largely the same. And so the Court of Justice has held that essentially the case law applying to either of the regulation or the directive um, is applicable both with regard to request to member state and European Union authorities. Um, as you see, I have here the case quotation in green. That will continue to be the case. So focus your eyes on the right uh, writing and just try to ignore all the little bits of green in between. Um, another part of the recap, um, this is just the general obligations of the public authorities when they apply exceptions, when they treat information requests. So this is a bit different on EU and member state level. On EU level, first of all, all interpretations to disclosure must always be interpreted strictly and the institutions must weigh the interest to keep the specific information confidential against the public interest in disclosing that information. And then for environmental information, there is a heightened threshold for restrictive interpretation. And the same applies for legislative documents. So for our documents related to a legislative procedure, again, another level of transparency. It's unclear what that really means concretely in practice, but this is nonetheless something that's always important to reiterate if you deal with the public institutions, uh, with the EU institutions. On member states level, it's a bit clearer a bit more straightforward because only access to environmental information is currently regulated on EU level, at least generally. There's some, of course, sectoral legislation that has specific provisions. And for all those environmental information, exceptions are to be interpreted restrictively. And again, 
the interest, the public interest must be weighed against the interest to keep that information confidential. And then there's two more general obligations that we'll be speaking a bit more later in this webinar as well. And on the one hand, that's the burden of proof, so to say, um, that rests with the authority, that it's the requirement that each ins the institution must establish for each specific document or disclosure would specifically and actually undermine a protected in interest. And this is different if there's a general presumption um, of non-disclosure for this category of documents. And this is something I explain later. And then there's also the obligation to disclose or at least specifically consider whether admissions into the environment are concerned. And that is something that Anne will talk to you about at the end of this webinar. So today's focus, um, we will try to walk you through to through what we think or in our experience are the most contentious exceptions from disclosure. So basically the categories of documents that are quite regularly withheld by the authorities and where there's quite a bit of case law from the court of justice by now on how these are to be interpreted. So we try to give you a bit more concrete idea about this. And we so we cover specifically inspections, investigations, and audits, which is only applicable on EU level, commercial and industrial information. That's my part. And then Anne will speak to you about um, the uh, uh, exception relating to the protection of the decision-making procedure and internal documents, as well as the so-called counter exception emissions into the environment that I've just mentioned. So starting off with commercial information, um, you know, with inspections, of course. Um, so the exception concerned here, it concerns the protection of the purpose of investigations, inspections and audits. So, and this is only applicable on EU level. So this is not reflected in the directive. And the test that has been established by the court is that disclosure needs to specifically and actually undermine the purpose of an investigation, inspection, or audit. So only in this case may the European Union institutional body withhold that information. So what the court has said in this regard is that um, there's on the one hand, uh, it must be shown quite clearly that the inspection or investigation is still ongoing on the specific point in time, doesn't automatically extend to the follow-up, following on from an investigation. Um, rather, it must be tested if the institution is still involved in this process and whether this has been carrying out in a reasonable period. If there's just not no action for quite a bit, then it's considered that the investigation is, is completed. And um, this also relates to the next factor that the court has mentioned. It must endanger the completion of the investigation. And that connects to the purpose of investigations. It's namely, it must undermine um, that the objective uh, must endanger that the objective of the investigation inspection can still be reached. And that's something we return to in a bit too. So, the only other thing that we have on as general indication from the Court of Justice is um, a very broad definition of what an investigation is. It has stated that it covers generally structured and formal or informalized procedure to collect and analyze information. So that means that it does not require an investigation to be aimed at detecting or pursuing, pursuing an offense or irregularity that's possible but not necessary. Um, so it can just be a thought of fact finding to assess the situation. And it also doesn't need to necessarily lead to a legislative act, but it can also be a really re leading to a report or recommendation or something like that. Um, there's not so much clear guidance yet on what is an inspection or an audit. I think the main takeaway here is that it's a very general and broad definition, but that there must be some kind of clearly defined procedural process that is aimed at collecting some facts. And there's a case here as well, that's the T471-08 case Toland, where it wasn't accepted that there was an ongoing investigation or inspection. Um, so then the thing that is 
relevant in the context of this exception is well, a general presumption of non-disclosure. And that's something I've already pointed to before. Um, so what does that mean? So normally, as I've explained before, an institution is required to demonstrate that disclosure of a specific document would actually and specifically undermine a protected interest. Now, but what the court has done is that it has recognized for certain categories of documents that there's a general presumption assume, so to say, that it would be um, prejudicial to disclose that information. So for these documents, it can presume that in principle, it would undermine the interest. And, and as a result of that, so if an EU institution invokes a general presumption, the applicant is only left with two possible arguments. On the one hand, he or she can argue that the specific document is not actually covered by the presumption because it doesn't fall within that category of documents, or it is not longer covered by it because the time, a lot of time has passed, for instance, or procedure has been finished. Or it can seek to establish that there's an overriding public interest in disclosure. And I'll speak about that in a moment. So to explain that at the end of an example, one that I think comes up quite a lot and is also relevant in the context of environmental law and environmental uh, activism um, concerns infringement proceedings. And this is uh, here is the court has uh, accepted that a general presumption exists and it's a very broad one. It extends to not only the litigation phase but also before the commission actually launched an infringement proceeding against the member state um, it includes the pilot procedure that gathers information about the infringement by the member state of european union law basically until it has taken a definite position not to pursue an infringement procedure or until the judgment has been rendered or the case discontinued um, and it applies, that's what the court has stated, as long as the, co the commission can establish that it's reasonable, foreseeable, and not purely hypothetical, that it will actually launch an infringement procedure. And one of uh, client, uh, our cases here, client Earth, in this one, the court has also accepted that um, conformity checking studies, so that studies prepared by the commission on compliance by the member state with European Union law can fall under that exception if they form part of a procedure. So in this case, the letter of formal notice had been sent to certain member states. And for these member states, the court considered that this general study fell within the scope of the infringement proceeding. Um, and only that the, the studies had to be disclosed for which the court, uh, the commission had not decided to take infringement action. So in practice, overall, this means that it's very difficult to receive information held by the European Commission on member states' violation of European Union law, because the European Commission will quite often or almost always be able to argue, well, perhaps uh, we are currently considering taking infringement proceedings, we're preparing infringement proceedings, um, we are preparing perhaps a foreign letter or formal notice, even if that doesn't then go ahead in the end. And that's a problem. And now the only way this could be defeated, at least in theory, is to establish an overriding public interest in disclosure of the information. But in practice, this is a very high threshold. So the court has said that, first of all, general considerations are not sufficient, must be very specific circumstances. Uh, one can rely on the need for increased transparency, but then one needs to show that is an especially pressing need. Um, and yeah, it must be separate from private interest. This includes, for instance, if you are having an ongoing court proceeding for which you require this information, um, all of that is insufficient. So in practice, the only time this has been applied so far, at least, uh, and confirmed by the court, was when uh, an EU institution actually wanted to withhold information that had been communicated to it by a third party. Um, I know it actually wanted to disclose information. Sorry. So um, the only case we have is where uh, 
for instance, the European Medical Agency has received information from a commercial undertaking, and then it wants to disclose some of that, and then the undertaking argues that some of it is co commercial information, then the institution may say, well, there's an overriding public interest here to disclose this. But there has never been a case where an applicant has successfully argued that the institution has failed to recognize that there was an overriding public interest. So it's, it's, it's just in practice, very, very difficult. And this is uh, illustrated here by a case example from an, actually our partner organization in this project, in the LIFE project, Justice and Environment. Um, this case concerned infringement proceedings that had been launched by the commission against a member state for failing to comply with uh, emission limits and the just environment wanted to have access to some of the information related to that infringement proceeding from the commission that was refused and so the just environment went to court and it argued essentially that there were public participation procedures ongoing on national level related to quality plans there was an ongoing environmental impact assessment procedure as well uh, they had, there was an ongoing court case on which this would have been relevant. Uh, they argued they would help them give legal assistance to people, that it would make the procedure more transparent. All these arguments are in this case, and the general court just goes through all of them and says it's insufficient, it's not specific enough, it's not clear why this is overriding. So it is just very, very difficult to establish such an overriding public interest, it would need to be very, very specific circumstances and unusual circumstances, perhaps an immediate threat to health and the environment or something in that regard. Um, so this is not the only general presumption of disclosure that is applied in the context of investigations by the court. There's actually a number of other ones. On the one hand, relate to the state aid file, to court, court submissions, as long as proceedings are ongoing, merger proceedings, competition investigations, and added by the general court now, uh, all of proceedings, so fraud proceedings. Um, so this actually covers a fair amount of the investigations that are carried out by the EU institutions. Um, but perhaps on a more positive note, there's also a case, at least from the general court, where a general presumption has been refused in the context of investigations. This was um, an investigation by the commission following refusal by a member state to register a vehicle under the air quality directive. So this procedure allows uh, a member state to say we do not want to register a vehicle for various concerns, including environmental concerns. Um, this one was a case where France refused to register certain Mercedes cars from Germany. The European Commission then investigated and Daimler sought access to that file because it concerned them, essentially. And the, um, the Commission had argued that there was a general presumption in this case. And the court said, well, this is an investigation for sure, but there is no general presumption in this case. And it based that largely on the fact that the Commission uh, had not been able to explain why it would really undermine the purpose of that procedure, why it would undermine the trust between the member state and the European Commission. And I think you can really see the difference to the infringement procedure, where the argument is always from the Commission, it undermines the trust of the member state, who will not cooperate with us if it's all transparent and everybody knows what we're saying. And in this case, the court essentially says these considerations do not apply here. There's a, a clear position that has been taken by the member state. and it wouldn't be undermined to disclose that information. So that might give some arguments, at least, in case we there are future general presumptions are proposed. So this is what I wanted to tell you about inspections, investigations, and audits, in particular, largely covered by many general presumptions. And now um, I'm turning to commercial interest. And as I said, if you have any questions, just type away whenever you want, and we can address them in the end. Um, so commercial and industrial information, including intellectual property. So there are slightly different formulations for this on the EU level legislation and the member state level legislation. It's included below the relevant provisions. I won't go through it that much here because it's not clear that it actually has so much of an impact in practice. But uh, nonetheless, 
there are differences in the way it's framed. Um, what I will focus on instead is the test that has been established by the general court, at least. We have very limited guidance on this in the court of justice. Um, the general court has said, first of all, it is not possible to regard all information concerning the company and its business relations to be covered by this exception. And that's, of course, very important because companies constantly engage in commerce and industrial activities. So it is not everything they do that is covered by this exception. Rather, the court said, it must be shown that the documents at issue contain elements which may, if disclosed, seriously undermine the commercial interests of a legal person. So that's very important that there's a bit of this heightened threshold and we come back to that because there's now an advocate general opinion that is calling this into question. And I will go through that one in some detail in the end. Um, further indications from the court as to what is commercial information, general court has kind of consistently held, includes commercial strategies, information on its customer relations, information that reveals its expertise. And then there are some added statements from both the Court of Justice and General Court relating to sales figures, market shares, business relations. So this is kind of the area that we're talking about when we talk about industrial commercial information. And uh, but of course, this lay leaves some lack of clarity because, as we said, we don't really have so much guidance from the Court of Justice. The only statement that we have so far is that the location of an installation that falls under the industrial emissions directive in the context of urban planning is not commercial information. But I mean, that should perhaps be obvious, um, but it doesn't really give us so much of clear indication. But if you go through the argumentation of the general court, because by now there's a range of cases, I think what we can say on the one hand, there's a bit of a competitive advantage test, so to say. Um, and that is, it appears that it's necessary that information will allow a competing company to gain a competitive advantage. So disclosure would essentially undermine. Uh, the functioning of the market in that sense. This is indicated in a number of statements by the general court that I've included here. On the one hand, the court has said um, it's relevant that the information, if disclosed, could be used profitably by another undertaking to gain an economic, strategical, or organizational and structural advantage. This is in the context of state aid. Um, it has held that a, a company that's publicly owned can still have commercial industrial information because it's active on the market. And here again, because it faces competition on the electricity market in this case, and is thus required to protect its interests. Um, this concerned a loan agreement. Um, and then another case here concerning the European Medical Agency and an authorization procedure for medicine, where again, the court has said, it's relevant that the disclosure of the information would allow a competitor to enter a specific market. So here we see that how commercial industrial information clearly relates to this aspect of competition, and it seems relatively well established. Things that are less clear so far, on the one hand, the content of contracts. Um, there is so far a few cases from the court, but it's not entirely clear. What is clear, I think, is that it's not generally just because something's included in the contract that the contract as a whole would be commercial information, but uh, rather the court has drawn certain distinctions, descriptions of tasks, whether it's management and monitoring, uh, parts that relate to the rights and obligations or identify business risks with other parts and so on. So there's a bit of a weighing to be done. And I've included here some cases in case there's interest. And the other thing, which is perhaps another test that has that seems to be implied by the court. Again, you know, this is all just reading the case law. Um, is that there needs to be some form of creative input. And this is reflected very much in uh, two lines of cases. One's concerning the European Chemical Agency that were actually led by client Earth, and then other cases that are kind of ongoing right now concerning the European Medical Agency. And here the general court has said, it has said that um, there is a necessity that the information concerns some new scientific conclusions 
or must relate to some kind of inventive strategy um, or that there's an individual and personal assessment that adds value. So it's not just reproducing something. It's not just a compilation of objective figures or data, but it's there's an added uh, value. And it's not, and the court has also said in this context, it's not in itself sufficient that there's a copyright, that uh, the um, uh, information has financial value, that's not in itself sufficient. It's not in itself sufficient that it's complex, detailed or specialized scientific information. All of this can be not commercial information. Um, if it is not shown that there is some form of creative input. And so this test has kind of been emerging in the case law. And uh, I come back to it because it has now been also criticized by the advocate general. So, but before I turn to that, um, what needs to be mentioned in the context of commercial interests as well is that there are some special re regimes, there are some legislative presumptions of non-disclosure, so to say. One example is REACH, so the chemicals regulation. Another one is the pesticides regulation. Um, and I think there are some other examples where there's basically some indications and specific regulations as to what is to be considered commercial information. And just to explain how that works in practice, at the example of REACH, there's two specific categories in REACH. There's certain information that is supposed to be actively disseminated. And then this kind of indicates a strong public interest and in disclosure also on request if that dissemination has kind of failed, so to say. Um, and then there's also kind of a legislative presumption of non-disclosure for other kinds of information. And here it kind of appears from the case law that this operates like a general presumption. Um, and here's an example, for instance, uh, under Article 118, the exact tonnage of the substance manufactured or placed on the market is covered because it will, would reveal the market shares of company. And this has been confirmed by the court too. Um, but then there might be a question, and this is uh, just whether there might be a possibility, for instance, to disclose a range. And so this this is, for instance, done by the commissions in the context of merger proceedings. So um, you see there's possibilities um, to avoid these. <laughs> but generally speaking, if something is specifically mentioned, it will be, again, quite difficult to overcome uh, in one of the regulations. So, um, and then the other thing to mention, general presumptions of non-disclosure established by the court through the case law, through not through legislation, not through regulation, is um, confirmed by the court in the context of state and merger proceedings, but these are also already covered by investigations. I already mentioned them before, so it's kind of a dual basis. Another one here from the general court now extended to tender information. But more importantly, for our con context, um, it has been refused in a number of cases. On the one hand, in the context of reach application documents. So uh, application documents um, for chemicals are not covered by a general presumption, going beyond what is covered in the regulation that I've just mentioned. Um, request for quotations, that's a bit of a specific context, but again, and the other area that's perhaps more relevant is also applications documents to the real European medical agency. And here we see again very similar argumentation as for REACH. So if we have these application procedures to um, put a substance on the place, a substance on the market and so on, the court has so far been quite clear that there isn't a general presumption, but that this has been really to be seen uh, document by document. So finally, um, before I will be handing over to Anne, I'll speak about the Advocate General opinion that I have mentioned already a few times now. Um, and because there's now two pending, actually three pending cases concerning um, general court decisions in the context of the European Medical Agency, and there has been an Advocate General opinion on two of these pending cases so far. And the Advocate General has proposed to overrule them on a lot of grounds, <laughs> that, uh, to overrule the general court. And he's making a number of very general statements, and that's why this is relevant to consider here. Um, for one, he has said that there should be a general presumption of confidentiality. So I just said that was refused. 
um, including here for the clinical study report, toxicity study report. So for a number of different kinds of information, mm, arguing be based on the fact that a competitor could use these as a roadmap and because data exclusivity could otherwise not be ensured. So data exclusivity meaning that there is in the context uh, market exclusivity and data exclusivity, which gives an operator the possibility to uh, market a medicine for a number of years. But because the same rules don't apply outside the EU, if you would disclose information, that would undermine kind of the business model there. So very much focused here on the competition aspect and um, uh, and not so much on the creative input. And I come back to that. Then he argued that the threshold that I mentioned of seriously undermining commercial interest is not appropriate and shouldn't be used because it's not found one to one in the legislative text and because he argues a certain de minimis standard is sufficient. He argued that there's no need to weigh the public interest in disclosure against the interest in keeping that information confidential, even though, as I've argued in the beginning, this is a general obligation, because he says this is not to be found in the first case in which it's mentioned, in the Torku case, that it's done differently in that regard. And he finally argues that there's no need for the information to be novel, there's no need for creative input, essentially. Um, it's uh, sufficient that there is an advantage for a competitor. So this is very problematic um, and because, and I walk you through this four arguments, on the one hand on the general presumption, essentially, and there's probably also much more reason for why this problematic, but I just mentioned some. Um, for the general presumption, what the Advocate General does here is he doesn't draw any distinction really between a risk of disclosure and um, so basically, if you look at a specific document, is there a problem with disclosing it and establishing a general presumption? Um, he just says, because there would be an impact on the competitive position of the undertaking, this is sufficient to establish a general presumption. If we would apply that logic in the context of commercial industrial information, that would give rise to general presumptions in a lot of places. It's a very problematic, argumentation and he's basing that on one of the cases that client earth has actually just won and calls it the client earth test so that <laughs> it doesn't really uh, put us in a great light either but it's just a bit strange reading of the case now um with regard to seriously undermining um he says essentially uh, that it's enough to have a diminishment threshold but as i said in the beginning there's really a specific a need for a specific threshold in the need of commercial industrial information because all information concerning an undertaking will always be commercial. So there is this needed threshold to have an added test. And it's not a problem that that's not mentioned in the legislation because the court is making up a lot of things by itself, so just general presumptions. So that's not really the argument. Um, with regard to weighing public interest, um, as I mentioned in the beginning, this is a generally applicable test. It relates to ensuring that there's a strict application of the exceptions and ensures the objective of openness is respected. And it's also mentioned in other cases of the Court of Justice that he kind of brushes over, namely in Access Info and in Infeld. And finally, the creative input test, which he doesn't want, I think it's a very good test if that would be also accepted by the Court of Justice because it goes beyond just looking at costs and the benefit for a competitor, because that will again be the case, especially in the context of EMA and REACH, in a lot of cases, because it's a very competitive market, they can always use something as a roadmap or so for their, further applica for their future applications. That, if that's sufficient, that's very problematic. What is very good is what the general court has done with focusing on this creative input and there having to be some novel part to the application because that would really define it in a bit clearer way and draw a distinction there. So this, uh, as far as um, arguing with Advocate General Hogan goes, but um, just I think it this the the Advocate General opinion kind of highlights what is important for the commercial information. Again, just to kind of repeat, um, the the relevant factors are clearly that there is a competitive aspect to it, 
um, but we need a bit more. And I think the case of the general code has given us a bit more by now. That is what I've kind of tried to cover and walk you through before. And so we kind of right now are at a point where we hope that some of that gets confirmed by the Court of Justice. Um, and now I will hand over to Anne, who will speak to you about um, the decision-making procedure and exceptions protecting that. <clears throat> Hello, so I'm going to talk to you first about our last exception that we're going to look at today, which is the protection of the decision making process. Um, so EU level, this exception is contained in our, this, the first subparagraph of Article 4.3 of Regulation 1049. Um, and it covers uh, documents drawn up or received by an institution for internal use relating to a matter where the decision hasn't yet been taken. Um, and it's necessary that the disclosure would seriously undermine the institution's decision-making process unless there is an overriding public interest in the disclosure. So there has been a, a test um, formulated by the court which says that uh, this, uh, this exception can only be invoked if access to the document would specifically and actually undermine the protected interest and the risk of harm must be reasonably foreseeable and not purely hypothetical. So you'll see in the case law examples that I'll talk about that the, the court has really, um, has really uh, applied this test in quite a strict way to the, to the institutions. Um, currently, there is no general presumption of confidenti confidentiality on the basis of this exception. Um, the general court had uh, established a general presumption back in 2015 to cover all documents related to legislative impact assessments uh, conducted by the, the European Commission before um, proposing legisl legislative acts or in deciding whether to propose the legislative acts. Um, but the Court of Justice overruled that decision back in uh, last year in 2018. So that's quite a happy situation compared to the other <laughs> exceptions. Um, so at national level, the Aarhus Directive um, has two provisions that kind of correspond to the decision-making uh, process exception in Regulation 1049. Um, the first one is Article 41E, um, and that's where the request concerns internal communications taking into account the public interest served by disclosure. And the second one is article in Article 42A of the, of the directive, and that covers the confidentiality um, of the proceedings of public authorities, but only where such confidentiality is provided for by law. Um, so first of all, I'll talk a little bit about the scope of this exception. So at EU level, um, we have a, a case, quite an important case, which really um, it concentrates on the context of environmental information. And it, it's interesting because uh, the court first looked at Regulation 1367 and said, well, the purpose of that regulation is to apply the Aarhus Convention. So basically, when interpreting uh, the, the exception in subparagraph 1 of Article 4.3, we have to look at the wording of the Aarhus Convention and they looked at Article 448, which is the one that protecting the confidentiality of proceedings. And so the court said that actually when you read these uh, provisions together, um, the concept uh, of decision making process should only really relate to the actual decision making um, and it shouldn't also cover the entire administrative procedure which led to the decision. So in the context of this case, that meant that the court um, said that it should not apply to data uh, which forms the basis of a decision. Um, and uh, when we're talking about, obviously, about um, the scope of the exception, it's important to remember again that um, the court has held in the context of this exception that there is a higher standard of transparency which applies to legislative documents and environmental information. Um, again, Sebastian said that it's difficult to know what this really means in, in concrete terms, but where the court uh, wants, to, um, wants to ensure 
more transparency in the decision making process. They really kind of use these um, concepts and legislative documents and environmental information as a hook in this concept of a higher standard of transparency. So it's always worth referring to that in your uh, in confirmatory applications because it can uh, it can be very helpful. Um, so at uh, at national level, obviously, there's a lot of um, national jurisprudence on the on the uh, national provisions that implement the directive, and um, I can't speak to all of those, obviously. So I'm really just concentrating on what we have at the level of the Court of Justice and also the Aarhus Convention Compliance Committee, because these findings obviously apply uh, to all of the member states. So, firstly, with regard to the confidentiality confidentiality of proceedings. Um, there was a question on a, a German court, uh, there's a preliminary reference to the Court of Justice on the question of what does it mean this condition that the confidentiality proceedings must be provided for by law? And they asked, well, uh, is it sufficient that in our national uh, legislation, which implements um, the Aarhus Directive, we say that this is an exception, that basically you can refuse disclosure on the basis of the confidentiality of, 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 um, uh, of proceedings. That's a law and therefore is, does that suffice? Um, it's kind of a bit of a circular argumentation in my opinion. And the court um, court said that actually this, it, that, that is enough, but only if the national law clearly defines the concept of proceedings. So, um, so that that will only suffice if the if proceedings is, is clearly defined in the, in the law. Um, the court, the convention, the Aarhus Convention Compliance Committee has also um, adopted some findings on this term, and uh, they kind of uh, uh, agreed in some respects with the with the Court of Justice. First, they said that the term proceedings it must relate to concrete events such as meetings or conferences. Um, and it doesn't uh, encompass all of the actions of a public authorities, um, including all of the related studies and documents. So this really um, kind of, uh, this this very much agrees with the saint Gobain case, which says that the concept of proceedings does not uh, relate to the, all of the administrative process. So we see some alignment there with the uh, compliance committee. Um, and again, they also said that the concept of proceedings must be as clear as possible in the implementing legislation and uh, because um, so as to avoid a kind of arbitrary application of this exemption so there's quite a lot of agreement as you see between the court of justice and the and the compliance committee um, in terms of internal communications what are those uh, we don't have any case law on this from the court of justice but we do have some findings from the compliance committee so um, they've said quite clearly that not every document that is communicated internally can be considered as an internal communication. Um, so again, and again, I'm harking back to the Sangovan case because this is really uh, in clear alignment with that. It says, so for instance, factual matters and the analysis thereof may be distinguished from policy perspectives or opinions. Um, then again, again, we have the same findings in relation to Romania where the committee clarified that uh, internal communications are really within the same entity and it doesn't cover um, communications between <laughs> somehow related but separate entities. Um, but of course there'll be far more case law um, and you'll have to look at that in the in the member state that you are uh, where you're requesting information. So I just want to give you some examples from the case law of the kind of justifications that have been used. Um, these are mostly, these are all from the European institutions. Um, but these are the kind of institutions that they, the, the justifications that they use to invoke uh, this, exa this uh, ex uh, exception. Um, in our experience, we often receive um, decisions from EU institutions which are basically um, have a rehash of all of these justifications um, very often. and. Luckily, the court has given us quite a lot of ammunition to to challenge to challenge them. Um, so I'll just go through them just now. So quite often we hear that um, the, the documents cannot can't be disclosed because the institution must be free from external pressure when it takes its decision, and it must be free from undue influence, um, so that its independence is not compromised 
uh, and it's room for manoeuvre and ability to, to reach an internal compromise is not compromised. And this, um, they often say that this is even more so the case when uh, the subject matter of the decision is, is sensitive. Um, they also say that um, disclosure would permit the public to raise questions or make criticisms in respect of the information uh, relevant to the decision making process and that this would then uh, certainly um, undermine, undermine the process. Um, another one is that we often hear is that um, uh, allowing the public to interfere uh, would lead to serious delay in the decision making process. And the last one is actually uh, one that was over, uh, is actually a justification that was put forward by the General Court in the Sangoban case at first instance, where um, the court said that it kind of, it kind of turned the logic of, of Regulation 1049 on its head and said that um, actually administrative procedures require greater protection from disclosure uh, than, than legislative activities. So I'm just going to run through how the court has dealt with a lot of these arguments and that obviously um, we can we can use a lot of this uh, case law um, in our own challenges as well. Uh, so in terms of the, the court has acknowledges has acknowledged that protection of decision making process from targeted external pressure may constitute a legitimate ground for restricting access to documents. However, they've said that the reality of such targeted external pressure must be established with certainty and evidence must be adduced to show that there is a reasonably foreseeable risk that that process would be substantially affected. Um, they've said in relation to the argument that um, because the subject matter is sensitive, that means that the decision making process would certainly be uh, undermined by external pressure. The general court has said such general, vague and imprecise statements do not prove that there is a genuine external pressure and are not based on any concrete evidence such as to justify them. So that really shows that the court is looking for very specific arguments that relate to the, the, the situation at, at hand. Um, in terms of uh, transparency, um, compromising the independence of officials involved in the decision-making process, the court has been really clear that transparency on the contrary ensures the credibility of that institutions to act in an independent manner and exclusively in the general interest and that it's not um, it's rather the lack of public information which raises doubts as to as to independence uh, just continuing this um, uh, the court has been clear that just the mere reference to a risk of negative repercussions um, is not it is not enough to to pass the test. Um, and in terms of timing, uh, the court has been quite clear that there's nothing uh, in Regulation 1049 that requires an institution to respond to public reactions following disclosure of documents, and therefore that uh, that 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 argument that disclosure could affect the, the timeline of a decision making process is kind of doesn't have any grounds. And then finally, with regard to the higher level of protection, which the general court said should be given to an administrative process um, as opposed to a legislative one, the court said actually that uh, despite the fact that yes, there's a higher level of, of transparency for legislative activity, that doesn't mean that that um, administrative act activity falls outside the scope of 1049. And as such, it still means that the exceptions have to be applied strictly. So that's that these, uh, all of these arguments can be very useful when challenging uh, the invocation of that, of that exception. So just some final remarks. So I've, from what I've said, it's, quite clear that it's very difficult actually in terms of the case law that's just um, that, that has just been kind of decided in the last sort of five five years that it's really difficult for an institution to invoke this exception and we should be um, kind of scrutinizing when they when they do um, I would imagine that, that it would only really be um, justified in quite uh, abnormal situations of, of external pressure um, in extreme demonstrations, etc. Um, however, if an institution were to successfully invoke the, this exception, 
um, it would still be possible for 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 the requester to argue that there's an overriding public interest in disclosure. But in that situation, the same considerations that Sebastian um, talked to you through earlier um, would apply. And if you remember, it's it's really very very difficult, in fact, for um, to, to, to make a successful argument that there's an overriding public interest in disclosure. Up until now, they've, they've all been rejected by the court. So finally, now that we've kind of walked you through all of the, uh, well, these kind of exceptions that we encounter uh, most regularly, um, I want to talk to you about uh, information on emissions into the environment, which is um, kind of what we, what we called it, the exception to the exception, um, because uh, in relation to some of the exceptions in Regulation 1049 and in the ARPUS Directive at national level, um, uh, once you um, demonstrate that the information you're requesting uh, falls under the definition of information on emissions into the environment, then it's no, simply no longer possible for the institution or the public authority in question to invoke certain of the e exceptions. So um, at EU level, this is kind of given expression through um, uh, through the concept that um, there is a presumption that there's an overriding public interest in disclosure of information on emissions into the environment, um, and this presumption kind of can you can be used to counter the exceptions in in Article Four Two of the regulation. That's the first and third indents. So that's in terms of uh, commercial interests. Uh, and intellectual property on the one hand, and on the other hand, the purpose of inspections and audits. So it's very important to understand that um, uh, this doesn't include investigations and particularly investigations on infringement proceedings. Um, so basically, um, information on emissions in the environment does not trump the, the general presumptions of confidentiality that cover investigations. Uh, and that can be quite problematic when we see it's the wide definition of investigations that the, that the general that, that the court of justice has uh, has handed down, which uh, Sebastian described to you. Um, at national level, uh, it's a bit the exception to the exception is a bit more far-reaching than at, at EU level. Um, we can use it to trump the exceptions in Article 42A, D, F, G and H of the directive. And the most kind of, uh, well, the ones that I think we've come across most often is the um, confidentiality of the proceedings of public authorities. So that means that it can actually be used um, against the exception on uh, with regard to the, which deal with the decision making process. And also the most common one, which is the confidentiality of commercial or industrial information. Um, so now a bit more about what uh, what is information on emissions in the environment. So um, up until mm, 2016, there wasn't a huge amount of case law on this, and the and the concept is not defined in in the legislation either in uh, in Regulation 1049 or the Arcus Regulation or the Arcus Directive, and it's not uh, defined in the Arcus Convention itself either. So um, until uh, until 2016. The, we kind of um, understood that it definitely included emissions from industrial installations, but uh, not much more than that was understood. There had been a case, which um, a client earth case, which I'll, I'll talk about a bit later, which said with some clarity that information on related to chemicals that are placed on the market um, is a bit too indirect. It's a, it, um, to be considered information on emissions into the environment because that link between placing a substance on the market and it being emitted into the environment was not direct enough. Um, however, this kind of changed in 2016, where we had two really landmark cases on emissions into the environment, both of which um, concerned uh, information on emissions from uh, glyphosate. From uh, I'm not actually, Bayer, I'm not sure if it was glyphosate, but they were both pesticides, that's for sure. Um, so the court kind of clarified that there are kind of two aspects to the concept. The first one is what are emissions, um, and the second one is what uh, what is an, a piece of information on on an emission. I.e., is there a sufficiently direct link between the information and the and the emission? At least this is how the court itself kind of um, tackled the tackled defining the the concept. 
So first of all, what is an emission? So as I said to you before, it had already been it confirmed in the case law that um, it definitely included emissions from industrial installations. Um, but the case uh, cases on glyphosate from November 2016 also clarified that this is, these are not the only emissions that are relevant. Um, the concept includes all emissions that are relevant to environmental protection. So this definitely includes emissions from pesticides and other chemicals. Um, it clarified as well that um, there is no distinction, distinction between the concepts of emissions, releases and discharges. And that's quite... Uh, it's quite um, important because different provisions of legislation talk about different things in terms of, uh, of those three concepts, but they are to be understood as basically all being within the, the definition of emissions. Um, so then the, in this case, it was the, the, uh, the institution, uh, institutions argued that um, the concept of emissions is only uh, limited to what is actually emitted into the environment. It's not, we're not talking about potential emissions or, or even foreseeable emissions, but the court disagreed and they said no, foreseeable emissions um, do come within the, the definition of, of the concept, um, particularly from a substance which in the course of normal use is intended to be released into the environment. Into the environment, into the environment, the slide says. Um, um, the only thing the court did clarify was that it does not relate to emissions that are purely hypothetical. And so this kind of um, concept of an emission that is foreseeable and an emission that is purely hypothetical is giving the court a little bit of trouble uh, at the moment and uh, indeed to other commentators as well. And that's going to be something that I think we'll see quite a lot of, lot of case law on in, in, the, in the future. So what about the link between the information and the emissions? So what actual information on the information comes within, the, within the, the concept? The court said it's not all information with any old link to the emission. Um, for, uh, first of all, it has to be data that will allow the public to know what is actually released into the environment or what it may be foreseen will be released into the environment under normal or realistic conditions of use. So this includes information on the nature, the composition, the quantity, the date and the place of the actual or foreseeable emissions. But that's not all. Uh, the court said that it also includes information which enables the public to double check the competent authorities assessment of those emissions. So that is why in the, in the, in the um, cases from November 2016, um, they held that in theory, uh, like inform in information, well, the studies basically that have taken place on a specific uh, the long-term effects of a, of a specific substance um, can be released to the public because the public really needs these studies to be able to double check that the competent authorities assessment of them was correct and this allows us to have have confidence in the decisions of, of our public authorities and to give them greater legitimacy um, so as I said, these those kind of landmark cases from the Court of Justice in November 2016 have now been applied in, in several cases, um, and they've actually had some kind of contrasting outcomes. So in the in the first case, um, all of these cases that that are highlighted on this slide relate to studies um, on glyphosate, which the Commission uh, and EFSA had to take into account in deciding. Uh, on the renewal of, renewal of glyphosate as an active substance in, in, in the pesticides that are marketed by Monsanto. Um, so uh, in the first case, the, this was the first one to be cited back in uh, 2018, um, the general court decided that actually um, because glyphosate as such isn't actually um, sprayed into the atmosphere, it's actually glyphosate once it's mixed in with all the other um, substances that make up the final pesticide product. They decided that the, 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 the studies were, um, uh, there was two, there wasn't a direct enough link with the, um, with the actual emission that was, or the foreseeable emission that was going to be uh, emitted into the environment. Um, in the second case, the general court seemed to take a different view of that and they decided that um, because glyphosate um, is already in the environment it's one of the most used 
um, substances and pesticides in the in the European Union. Um, not only was it um, was this information on foreseeable emissions, it was actually information on actual emissions because they, it is a it is a reality. So um, they decided that the studies shouldn't be should be released. So um, we can see that. Uh, I think to un really understand the difference between this case, you have to have a very good understanding of uh, EU pesticides regulations. Um, but you can see that there's already some contrasting kind of cases coming out. Um, so just some final remarks on that. Um, so in terms of the concept of what is a foreseeable emission under normal or realistic conditions of use, the glyphosate cases refer to um, it, it, it's a, it's a normal or realistic conditions of use if they align with um, the conditions under which um, the authorization to place that product or substance on the market was granted. Um, but what does this mean? Um, uh, for example, uh, yes, in, in relation to glyphosate and pesticides in general, in those cases, the court really kind of um, focused on the fact that that is the kind of intended purpose of, uh, of pesticides. They are to be sprayed and emitted into the environment. However, um, I think it would be foolish to ignore that um, even if that's not the intended use during the life cycle of, of a particular substance, we know that in, in once that substance becomes waste at the end of its life cycle, it is emitted into the environment um, in the way that the waste is dealt with. And it will be interesting to see if the court will take that into account, seeing as though waste is completely foreseeable. Um, so, um, and secondly, Another interesting thing was that, as I said at the beginning, uh, when I first started talking about the case law on emissions, um, the court had, um, the general court had taken a decision that um, uh, information on the placing of chemicals or substances on the market um, was not, uh, was not information on emissions into the environment because at that point we were only talking about a potential uh, emission or a potential release into the environment. Um, however, the, the Court of Justice back in, in, in November 2016 um, clarified that that situation is different for a substance um, which by its very, uh, by its very um, function um, is, is intended to be released into the environment. So um, there is a question on whether for some of those uh, some products, i.e. those where by their very use or function they are really uh, emitted into the environment, where their information really, uh, on their placing on the market would be now, term, now seen in terms of um, as information on emissions into the environment. So that could be, for example, the quantity of a product that's placed on the market um, and, the pla and the place of its use, etc., which at the moment is kind of uh, very much protected uh, by by companies placing chemicals on the market. So, um, oh, what happened? Oh. I think you can see that there's still quite a lot of places for this. Uh, there we go. There's still uh, a lot, there's still a lot of room for a lot of room for maneuver in the case law and information and emissions and the environment. I'm sure we're going to see quite a lot of cases on that in the in the in the near future. And I'll be looking forward to that. Anyway, that brings us to the end of this webinar. So now is your chance to ask questions, as I see we've got some already. Um, but before we look at them, I just just um, to I just want to draw to your attention that um, we're going to do one more webinar in January on access on challenging um, refusals of, of access to environmental information. And this time we're going to do a very step by step and very practical guide to how to request environmental information and then challenge it. So that's the kind of thing, what should go, what makes a good request as opposed to a less good request? What are the best uh, ways to send it or the platforms to use to send it? Um, what should you do really concretely when an institution doesn't respect the deadlines? Um, how do you frame a, a, a confirmatory application? And what do you take into account when deciding on whether to challenge
get a kind of definitive refusal in court. So we'll really kind of go through, a, do a very, a much more practical um, webinar next time. And so look out for, for when that will take place. We haven't set the, the final date yet. Right, should we have a look at some questions? Yeah, let's use the last 10 minutes for that. Um, I believe you can't see the question, right? Sure. So I'm just going to make answer this one so that I think you can see it then. The first, uh, I think it's just a, a remark um, for of an interesting practice relating to state aid that indeed it is difficult to receive information on pre-notification files, but that it may be necessary, it may be possible in some cases to obtain the commission's letter that closes the pre-notification procedure and is addressed to the member states. Um, and so it's, um, yeah, and so here's an experience uh, that this has been possible in some cases. I think that's, uh, yeah, it's, it's that's very, an interesting remark on on this. I, I have personally not any further experience with that. Do you have Anne? No. Okay. And not that pre-notification stage, no. Exactly. But I think this is a good example of where you can try with the general presumptions to see where they end. I think that's always the most important part because, as we've said, it's really difficult to establish an overriding public interest, but you can always argue that a specific document is not actually covered. It doesn't fall in the same category, perhaps due to passage of time, due to the fact that the decision has yeah. been rendered and so on. I think this is Exactly. I what. think that there's some, uh, in some cases, it is uh, possible to go through a member state uh, to get some of some of the documents that are covered by general presumptions at uh, EU level. However, uh, I think that is it, that possibility is kind of being closed off, and certainly in terms of infringement procedures, um, because the <laughs> I think that the I think the member states no longer, in general, really give access to information now that's covered by the general presumption on on um, infringement procedure, procedures, but I'd be interested to know if anyone has any uh, any recent um, experience of that. Okay. Um, is there a specific definition of public interest? I don't believe so. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I think there, there's none. I think what I've, I've mentioned a bit is that there's some case law saying that it needs to be a general public interest and not a private interest in the sense that I think I mentioned the cases where a person was in a court proceeding and was saying this this was relevant for these court proceedings that he would receive that information. Um, and that was considered to not be um, sufficient. I think there's another case from the Czech Republic, and um, no, not, I mean, a case in front of the Court of Justice concerning the Czech Republic. I think some tenants were involved in the interest of the tenants. And then again, the court said that this was a private interest. I would have to look this up as well. So I think there's um, there's some indications that it needs to be public, but it needs to, I think, mostly, um, yeah, no, no very precise definition. And I think everything can be argued, but it is it needs to be very specific and heavy and particular for it to be successful to be considered overriding. I think at, me at member state level, in some member states, there may be more guidance on that. I think in the UK, for example, there's a bit more guidance on what is a, a general uh, a general public interest. So that's worth, if you're wor working uh, at all at national level, it's worth looking at the case law and the, and the, and the implementing provisions there. Um, and Juliette asks, um, if so, um, if the if, yeah, if the EU in terms certainly in terms of um, their their refusal of overriding public interest, and also um, I think probably you may be talking about the just the general presumptions in general, um, and these systematically prevent disclosure. So, is there another forum to argue that the EU legal system prevents disclosure of documents? Um, so, definitely, there's the there's the compliance committee that's certainly worth uh, thinking about and we have thought about it um, often um, but um, 
In terms of the ECHR, it's a shame that our colleague um, Gosha is not here because she is our ECHR expert in terms of access to documents. Um, but I'm not sure exactly, to, to be honest, I, I'm, I, I would have to get back to you on that because I'm not sure of the really precise um, standards in terms of transparency that's applied by the ECHR. I'm not sure if it's um, at the moment developed enough to make that a realistic option. I, mm. I doubt it. Yeah. yeah, that would be my feeling as well. But yeah, indeed, we, we have talked about the possibility of maybe bringing this at one point to the attention of the compliance committee, um, with, who, which has, of course, been clear that in, uh, in theory, at least, there should be some kind of um, specific considerations of the exceptions. And I think in particular, if you can show that it's just not really possible to show in a number of cases to get access to information at all, um, then that, that might be something to consider. And yeah, we, we yeah. are talking about it. My, yeah, my feeling is that certainly in terms of the general presumption that covers information and in infringement proceedings, I think this is an example where the institutions are almost placing them, the kind of uh, justifying, justifying themselves uh, in terms of not really applying the convention. Uh, by saying that the EU is just a very specific kind of beast that that, that, that that cannot, just simply can't comply with all of the Aarhus Convention, which was basically thought up to apply to member states. Um, and I think that we certainly don't really um, buy into that argument. So uh, it's a problematic area at the moment. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, I think these are all the questions that we've received so far. And we, oh no, there's a fourth one just now. Can you explain the can you yeah, explain sure. the facts of the glyphosate case? Okay, so there are a few different ones, but um, so um, I think I'll go. I'll very quickly go back to the slides and I'll tell you which one that I'm going to explain. Mm -hmm. Ah, I don't know. Um, so basically, there was a case where Greenpeace and and Pan asked for kind of very specific information on the glyphosate studies so the studies that were kind of submitted by the but not only so there are <laughs> this was all in the context of the uh, reapproval of glyphosate as an active substance under the pest eu pesticides regulation so the procedure of that is quite um it's quite complicated but quite important to understand to really understand the facts of that case um but anyway basically the company that wants to market a, glyph um, a pesticide with glyphosate is it has to provide you know studies to um the 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 member state that's in charge of that in this case it was germany and then um efsa and the commission have to make a final decision and so the greens um greenpeace and pan asked for specific information and those studies provided by um it was kind of it was basically the report that had been done by germany um when it was giving its first assessment of uh, whether it should be reapproved re um and the general court uh said that um that, that yeah this was information on emissions and then the commission uh challenged that before the court of justice uh, where the Court of Justice gave its kind of guidelines on what are emissions and in, emissions and in, information on emissions into the environment, and then they sent it back to the General Court to actually apply the Court of Justice's judgment. And so, in applying the Court of Justice's judgment, the General Court said that um, because this was the procedure for approving an active substance, which is then put into the final product, that the information did not have a direct enough a link with the with what would actually be emitted because what would actually be emitted would be the the active substance when it's mixed together with all the other substances that are in the final product um now in the the case the other case that i talked about which was how which was a green meps that asked for again it was information on the studies that were taken into account in that reapproval uh, procedure but they asked for slightly different information it was information on the long term um toxicity studies and in that case the court of justice applied that same pan and greenpeace case and found that um, um it was still important for citizens to know what are the long-term effects of of glyphosate because glyphosate is found in the environment because it is one of the substances that make up the final pesticide that's that's sprayed into it so yeah they are the kind of the facts of the case does that does that explain things better 
Yes, Carol says yes, so that's great. Thank you. <laughs> okay, and I think this also brings us to the end of the time. So the webinar we had allocated an hour and fifty minutes, so that's perfectly on time. Um, as Anne already mentioned, we have the next webinar in January. We uh, the we put the exact date very soon, and we also have a number of documents on our website. If you look for the, the Client Earth website and there's a specific section on the Access to Justice for a Greener Europe uh, project, and there's the, the guide on Access to Justice and the specific toolkits, have a look at that. And also there are links to our previous webinars as mentioned in the beginning. So thank, thank you. you. Thank you very much <laughs> for your attention. Yes. And have a good rest of the Thursday. Thank <laughs> you.